Hello and welcome. So in this video, we're going to look at a new software called Instamat. If you're not familiar with it, Instamat is kind of the newest thing out for texture. Uh, I don't, I was going to say texture painting, but honestly, texture generation, um, I think is the most uh, descript way to put it. It's got the equivalents of substance designer, substance painter. It has substance sampler and, uh, you know, like a whole bunch of other stuff related to even mesh creation, whole pipeline stuff. Um, in this video, we're going to look at the substance designer equivalent called Instamat Element Graphs. And my God, I am, I'm honestly just blown away. It has a ton of in it. But enough talking and looking at my stupid face. Let's get into it. So where can you get it? If you head on over to instamaterial.com, I'll put a link in the description as well. Uh, you can click on that and come on over to here. If you see this, you are in the right place. So head on up to the top right, get it for free. Yeah, you heard that correctly. You can get this for free, which is really cool. If we scroll on down, you can see that the Pioneer license is what you're going to want to be looking for. Instamat for Pioneers has all of the you know fully featured components of the software that you'd expect for a full price, uh, completely free if you make under $100,000 annually. The only kind of stipulation is that it does require attribution when you use it and data sharing. Uh, you can take a look more here to see what that's all about, but you're welcome to use this commercially as long as you hit that price point stipulation. And chances are for most of us individuals, uh, we're not going to be even close. So don't worry about that. So go ahead, get Instamat. It will require that you kind of log in and create an account, and then you're going to have to go and uh, download the software after that. It, it's not the most straightforward process, I'll, I'll be honest, but it should be easy enough for you to kind of stumble through it like I did. And then once you get that going, go ahead, boot it up, and I'll meet you in a second. So once you open up Instamat, you're going to be greeted with the splash screen here, and it's got a lot of different options you can choose from. You can see on the left-hand side, these are all based around documentation and projects that you can do with the software. The middle piece here is actually uh, recent projects that you've gone ahead and worked on. So you can jump back into a couple of different projects that you had opened previously. So you don't have to go through uh, loading them every time. And then on the far right side is uh, just kind of like a release stream and a bunch of news that are from the official Instamat channels. Um, you can see as of right now, we have uh, an update coming in a day or so uh, live stream. So I'm excited to tune into that. By the time you're watching this, it's probably already been loaded up onto YouTube. So check it out if you haven't seen it. But to start a new project here in Instamap, let's go and create a new Instamap project. And we're going to have a bunch of different options within this uh, project scheme which is going to be really cool. I look forward to kind of exploring a lot of these myself and maybe doing some tutorials based around some more advanced things like uh, the end pass graph or the atom graph. Those seem to be really cool building block types of graphs that we can use to create really cool uh, nodes and workflow utility tools. Uh, but we're not there yet. Let's start with something a little more simplistic and a little more familiar um, if we have any experience with applications like material maker or substance designer and that's going to be the element graph it gives you a bit of a rundown of what to expect but this is essentially the same as creating a pixel-based material texture generating graph so let's go ahead and click on this and let's create without a template because i want to start everything completely from scratch all right, so you have Instamat open, and hopefully it looks relatively similar to the UI that I have here. Again, yours might look a little bit different depending on when you've actually downloaded Instamat. Now, throughout this series, I'm going to really only try to focus on um, whatever's important to the project as we're working at it at that time. So we're not really going to be doing an overview to the software. Uh, Instamat officially on their YouTube channel has a lot of really good tutorials that are done that cover a lot of this stuff. And so the main focus of this video, as long as it is, is going to be uh, just getting your hands dirty with the software, actually creating a more streamlined and focused project. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. First to do that, I want to go up and select our 3D and 2D viewport here so we can actually start to see some of the uh, texture work that we're doing. 
And in my canvas layer, I wanna start us off by creating a brick generator. So I hit space bar to go ahead and bring up this search menu there. And then I'll just double click on this brick generator. So this brick generator is going to be really foundationally the basis of this project. Um, and it's a really handy node because it's gonna set us up perfectly for creating that brick pattern shape. Now to view this in our 2D view, you can go and just single click on the output here and you can take a look at that. But you'll notice that uh, throughout this series, I just go ahead and double click. Now by default, double clicking on a node is actually going to open it up and you can see the inner workings of the node. Uh, so to change that, if you come on up to edit and preferences and you come on down to canvas, if you go ahead and find this double click behavior and you change it from open graph to preview output, make sure to hit okay. So that now you can go ahead and just double click on these and it will view it in uh, 2D. If you have the muscle memory of substance designer, much like I do, um, this is a godsend. I'm pretty much guaranteeing that you'll have to do this because you're gonna be opening 110 different graphs every time you open the software, if you don't do it. Okay, so now that we have that set up, let's go and start to set up our bricks here. So I'm gonna select this node in our 2D view and come on over to the right-hand side where we have the ability to tweak these parameters for this generator. So in my uh, kind of playing around, I went and set our count output to a factor of four by 12. Now, if we go and start to just play around with this by default, we're gonna have these numbers locked. So I wanna make sure that I uh, check that little uh, lock off so that I can go and edit these independently. So I'm going to do four on the X. Let me just get a better view of this here. And we're gonna do 12 on the Y so that we're getting more elongated bricks, but we're still getting a good amount of them. Now, by default, if we take a look at these bricks, the bevel is gonna be way too high. So I'm gonna change our bevel factor down to something like 0.02 which is giving us just the slightest indication um, of a bevel along the edges there. I'm also going to uh, round off the corners just a little bit. So I think in my studying, I did around uh, 0 0.2, kind of just give it a bit of a roundedness to it. And then the rotation variance, again, very subtle, but something like 0 0.05, so that they're just kind of you know, not perfectly rotated. They're kind of haphazardly thrown in there, right? That's going to be a little bit of a selling point for this type of brick. Now, as we're working, you might notice that um, it appears that we have an alpha channel. Even though the image is in uh, black and white, it looks like we kind of have this alpha channel. Something to be aware of when working in Instamat is uh, unlike Substance Designer, some nodes have the ability to either be grayscale or color. And you'll see that um, this node is actually operating in color based off of the color of these sockets here. So you can see that they're half green, half gray. Green indicating that they are RGBA uh, color space and gray indicating that it is grayscale. So with this node selected, if I come on up to the instance properties, you'll see that we have this little grayscale uh, toggle box. If I go and select this, now we're getting a completely grayscale node and it's going to be working in grayscale. We get rid of that kind of alpha channel there. So if you ever are working with a node that uh, looks like it's black and white, but it, it very clearly has an alpha channel, um, make sure to take a look under the instance properties. So next up with our bricks, I wanna come on over to the luminance and I'm gonna change the variance up again to around 0.2. So that's, uh, they're just going to have a bunch of different random uh, grayscale values, right? This is going to give us a more elevated or depressed uh, brick, uh, sad bricks, poor bricks. Um, but it's going to allow us to change the elevation of the bricks later on. And then we're also going to take a look at the offset. So the offset's where we start to uh, play around with some of the positions of these bricks. So let's set our distance to 0 0.5, and we can also change the variance of that so that they're not uh, completely just alternating. We have a bit of human error within our 
uh, repetition patterns here. So let's set the variance to something like 0 0.1. So now we can see that uh, things aren't lining up exactly. We're still getting a bit of uh, some mess ups from the, uh, the brick layers, <laughs> you know, uh, shoddy job. Fantastic. So that's looking cool already. But the last thing I want to do with our brick generator node is come on down to the size. And here's where we can play around with a lot of that uh, gap variance between the bricks, right? Where we're, our mortar is going to uh, kind of come like oozing out. So I'm going to change the gap to be uh, 0 0.5. So there's actually going to be some space between these bricks. I'm also going to change the gap variance to be around 0.4 so that the bricks are kind of different sizes. That's kind of a way that we can change the scale of these. And then you can also go ahead and play around with some split positions if you want to, uh, you know, change kind of these um, sizes of some of these bricks. Some of these split uh, sliders is how you're going to be able to do that. But this is looking pretty good uh, for our first kind of go at generating some of these brick patterns. Now, so far we've been visualizing our bricks here in our 2D view but we don't have anything displaying up in our 3D view. And that's because we don't have any outputs here in our canvas graph to uh, indicate uh, or hint to Instamat that, you know, hey, we actually want to start seeing some of this pop up on our uh, 3D material area. So I'm going to drag and drop the output of this, and I'm going to start to type in height. Now, you'll notice that we have a bunch of different nodes that are height related, but I don't really want to create um, a new function node. I actually want to set an output. So right up at the top, we have this action uh, category, and you can see that we have expose height as graph output. Um, now, right now, it doesn't seem to provide any uh, feedback as to what an output would be, but this is exactly what we want to do. So if I double click on that, Right, we have this set output node. You can see that it accepts one value and it also has this little uh, right leaving arrow. This means that this is an output node so that we're actually outputting this data and Instamat is picking it up and using it for other things. Now you might've noticed, if you take a look at your 3D view, uh, that we have some displacement down in uh, on our model here. Yours might not be as uh, grand as mine is because uh, I do have some of the settings already set up. But we're going to take a look at uh, setting up the 3D viewport here in just a second. I want to set a couple more outputs. Now you'll notice that if I single click in our canvas area, right, we've created this height output. We can also go and create output parameters here. So if I click on this, we can go and create an element image. And this is going to give me uh, that sRGB or the RGBA color space. And we just have this parameter here. Now we have to give it a proper name. Right now it doesn't really know how to use parameter. Um, it's pretty ambiguous what that name actually indicates. So if I come over to our outputs and I double click, I'm gonna call this normal. And you'll see that um, as I start to type this in, it is providing me with an autofill. So it recognizes that the name normal is going to be an actually useful type of texture map within Instamat, and it's going to know how to use that. So if I select that, you'll see that it's going to go black. The shading is going to change uh, drastically in our 3D viewport because now I'm providing it a normal map of completely black. So we need to go and rectify that here in our graph for this to update appropriately. So I'm going to drag and drop this out and I'm going to start to type in height to uh, normal, if I can type correctly. And we're going to have this height to normal node. So I can double click that and set that up. So now we're getting a normal map and a height map showing up in our 3D view. Now the final output I would like to do, I'm going to drag and drop out my socket again, is ambient occlusion. So first I'm going to set a height to ambient occlusion node. I'm not just going to drag in my height, um, you know, kind of unfiltered because I want to generate um, an appropriate ambient occlusion map here. And from this node, what I'm going to do is start to type in ambient 
occlusion. And I can go ahead and expose this again. And now I'm typing this out entirely. It's going to allow me to expose it using this name I've typed in. And Instamat is going to know that uh, with this specific name, how to use this on your uh, 3D model. So if I double click on this, you'll see that it creates this node and it's also created um, some ambient occlusion shading on our 3D model here. So I'm going to quickly just go and rearrange. So I'll shift and left click to uh, soft select that. And we can do the same thing down here. Now, how do I set up our 3D view, right? Yours might not look exactly like mine uh, because I've already had some time to set up some of this stuff. So I'm going to quickly just jump into my uh, 3D view here as center stage. So just coming up into the canvas area and clicking this little uh, cube icon, that's going to swap my UI around, but it's going to put my 3D view right here at center stage. So coming back to the left-hand side, I want to go and select viewport settings. That's where a lot of this viewport magic is going to take place and where we can switch a lot of these settings. So you'll see that we have a bunch of camera settings. We can change the field of view. Uh, you can change the exposure and even the tone mapping if you wanted something a little bit more specific for whatever you're doing. Uh, you can even change the saturation and the hue and the lightness. Um, again, I don't know a single use case I would use that for, but I mean, I like having options, so I'm glad that they're here. Here's where we can also change out some of the HDRI uh, lighting scenarios that we have for this and change some of the opacity and blurring uh, functionality for that. Now, if you scroll on down to the bottom, here's where we actually get to play with some of those displacement settings. So you'll see that we have uh, material AO intensity. So you can go and crank that up so that if you do have a material ambient occlusion output set in your graph, you can change that intensity here. We can also change the type of displacement mode. So we can set it to none. So it's just going to give us um, a regular material mapped 3D object with no actual displacement going on. We can set it to tessellation, which is actually going to displace the geometry that we have. If I turn on the wireframe, uh, you can see that um, it's, it's showcasing the wireframe for the original model, actually, now that I think about it. Right here is the geometry. And then once we go ahead and tessellate it, um, it's pushing that geometry outside of our model. And we can also do parallax occlusion mapping. So it's um, kind of more like a shader trick than anything, where it's pushing uh, our texture kind of inwards on this cube, just doing a bit of a shader trick. So you have your kind of pick for how much intensity and the type of displacement that you want to go ahead and start using. And then once I'm satisfied with that, I'll go back to our viewport here, make sure that our canvas is back in center stage and we're good to go uh, really getting started on our material. Okay, so back to the material. Now, the next thing I wanna take a look at is starting to create some grunge and uh, just overall wear to the shape of some of these bricks because as they stand right now, right, they're a little too uniform. So we need to go ahead and start destroying them a little bit. And that's one of the best parts of uh, working in these node-based structures is that they have a ton of different grunge textures. So let's first drag and drop this out. And I'm going to create a reroute image node. So this one's a bit different than a regular node. It's more organizational in its utility because you can see that right now we have this node branching off to three different areas. And that's going to be really hectic as we start to try and add uh, blends and new types of um, information onto this node because then we have to start uh, moving the connection every time. So instead, we can just go and control and click and drag that onto the output of our reroute so that we can go and uh, if I can drag this over here, right? Keep that over there, drag our uh, brick generator back and we can start working on a nice clean and linear path. So let's go and add a blend node. So I'm gonna right click on this selection and go and find blend. Um, if yours doesn't appear up in your favorites, you can go and start to type in blend as well. And we can select this. Now I want to go and uh, pop the brick generator into the background. 
socket for this blend. So what I could do is control and then click to do that, right? And that's going to uh, pop it into the back there. But a lot of these nodes in Instamat actually have the idea of quick actions. You can see on the right hand side, we have this quick actions button and it allows us to swap the input parameters. So if I click this, you can see that it's going to swap uh, which socket that brick generator is in. And you can actually even go into your preferences and assign a hotkey to this. Uh, so I have uh, my hotkey for this to shift X. So I'm pressing shift X on my keyboard to uh, even perform this quick action, which is really cool. So now what I'd like to put in our foreground is a type of grunge map. Now you can use whatever you want for this particular area, but what I went ahead and used is called clouds alien. And you'll notice as you're kind of looking around at a lot of these nodes, uh, there is a whole ton of different grunges that you can use for uh, your Instamat materials. Like there's honestly a metric ton of <laughs> grunges and stuff. They've really thought of a lot of different things, which is really cool. On the other hand, it's uh, really pushing me outside of my comfort zone uh, because I can't be relying on the BNW spots one node anymore. So I'm trying to find my new kind of favorite grunge maps. So once we've got this plugged in, we can see it's honestly, I think that looks really cool just as a grunge map in and of itself. Just move this around and actually, instead of using a cube, I'm going to hit V on my keyboard. Uh, you can also go ahead and select this little load mesh down here. And I'm going to choose this cylinder. So we have uh, something that's a little bit nicer in our 3D viewport. And so what I'd like to do is change our blending mode from default over to divide. And we see that uh, we also have a ton of different blending options, uh, far more than we get in pretty much any other application for texturing. So that really isn't going to do a whole lot if we kind of swap back between these. It's maybe going to add a little bit um, on the edges and it's going to really brighten everything up. But uh, really, this doesn't really start to shine until we bring the opacity of this blend way down. So 100 is really too crazy. If I start to bring this down, though, hopefully we start to see it uh, kind of update in our 3D viewport here. And I'm going to do something like maybe 7% so that we're starting to get some of these kind of cuts into. And maybe I need to go and select a different environment. If I just go and hit I. Maybe select something like that. Yep. So we can see that we're getting a lot of these uh, kind of cuts just randomly around. So that's going to be a good start. But now where a lot of this grunge is going to come from is if we go and add yet another blend on top of this. So right clicking, selecting blend. I'm going to add another noise to this. So I'm just going to put it in the background for right now. And I'm going to search for stone noise. And this is, again, just another kind of random, crazy uh, type of grunge material. I'm going to swap my input parameters so that that's on top. And then I'm going to switch the blending mode to add, subtract. So now when I do this, right now we can see if I double click on this, we're getting a lot more um, of that kind of weird inconsistency with the bricks. Now 100% is a little too intense. So with this blend again, I'm going to bring that down to around 15%. So now we're starting to get some of that uh, surface detail along these bricks. So that's a pretty good start to things here. Again, we're getting some interesting detail on top of our bricks already. Um, if you're finding it's a little too tough to view this in your 3D view, what we can do is also come on over. I'm going to add an output to our output parameters here and let's go and select element image and I'll just make sure to call this I believe it's base color yep there we go you can see it pops up there we go and I'm going to put this up top here and for right now I'm just going to set it to a solid mid gray color so if you're familiar with designer you're probably going to start to type in uh, uniform it's not going to show up. In Instamat, what it's referred to as is solid color, right? It's just a solid standard color. Plug this in. And then we can set this 
in uh, as a mid gray here. Now we have a couple of different options, uh, but what I'm going to do is just click on this value slider. This is saturation value, and then you can also play around with the hue here. I'm going to click and hold on this V or value slider, and then just drag my mouse up so that it's something kind of like a mid to dark gray. And this is going to be our color for a little bit. So, but it's going to allow us to uh, have an easier time actually seeing what's going on with our bricks here. And now the next thing I want to do is add some of that directional kind of swooping and like cuts into our bricks as if they've been kind of uh, scraped or something. You kind of generally see this design um, in a lot of different bricks. At least when I was researching some different references, I saw this uh, kind of pattern a lot. So let's go and right click and add a blend. And we'll just swap this out because I know it's going to be in the background here. And the node I'm going to be looking for is called Swipes and Wipes. And honestly, I think this might be my new favorite node. I love the name, first of all. I think that's hilarious. And also, I just think it's a really cool type of um, grunge pattern that is a little more involved um, to really kind of create in other applications. But this just comes out of the box, which is really, really handy. And if we take a look at it, right, it's just a bunch of different kind of like streaked uh, textures, which we're going to be able to use to create some of those uh, cuts and those chips. So I'm going to plug this into our foreground, but there's a couple different uh, things I want to do on this first. Um, actually, maybe what I'll do is just change the blending mode before we get to that so we can see what's going on. So let's change it to be subtract, right? We want these to cut away from our bricks. You can kind of see the uh, design I'm going for here. And I'm also going to bring this way down to like 10%. Uh, so it's not going to be like crazy, crazy cut in. It's just going to be more surface level. So back on our swipes and wipes, let's go and uh, decrease the scale. In my studying, I found that around 35 seemed to be uh, a lot better. It's just a little bit better for the uh, actual scale of these cuts. I'm also going to change the environment again to maybe something kind of like that. There we go. I think I just ended up changing it back actually to what we had before, but whatever. I'm also going to change my variance up to around about 65. And uh, in my studying, it looks like I changed the smudge blur to be around 20%. So it's not as blurred. Um, if we actually go back to the texture here, I believe this smudge blur. Yeah, it just kind of blurs um, a bunch of that, which I don't think we need a crazy amount, but maybe a little bit less there. So I think that's looking really cool, but uh, I feel like it's kind of going in the wrong direction. You'll see that it's got this kind of like diagonal directionality to the, the node originally. So what I'd like to do is run this through a transform node. Again, pretty much familiar with uh, any material authoring application, right? We're going to transform or change uh, the orientation of this node. And I just went ahead and in our uh, editor property uh, area over on the right-hand side, we can just go and rotate that uh, so that it's more like a 90 degrees running kind of east to west or left to right. So now it's going to be kind of more along the, the length of the bricks as opposed to this weird diagonal cut. So that's looking really good. We'll continue along our chain and maybe I'll bring these all the way back a lot more because we still have quite a bit to do. And this time what I'd like to do is I'm going to use a slope blur node. Now again, uh, this is a familiar node if you're kind of familiar with Substance Designer. And this is going to allow us to start to distort the kind of shape of the bricks, not just the surface kind of read of them. And we'll see that's yeah, doing a pretty good job by default. Um, this is maybe pretty extreme and not exactly what we're looking for. So for this height input, what I'm going to do is use a clouds heavy node. And this is just a regular kind of grungy texture. Now there's a couple of things I would like to change of this clouds heavy because it's, uh, it's pretty intense right now. So let's go and change the scale of this down to around one. So it's a lot softer. I'm also going to change the frequency gain to around 0 0.2. So again, we're just kind of smoothing this out a little bit more. 
And I'm also going to change the frequency smooth to around 0.8 so that we're not really uh, drastically changing it. We're just slowly building up each one of these layers one little piece at a time. Now for the slope blur, again, I find this is maybe uh, not exactly quite where we need it yet. I'm going to change the mode from default to minimum. And you'll see the difference between these is if I go back to default, right, we have this brick kind of blurring outwards from the brick, which uh, it really isn't the look that we want. We don't want to, this to really add any detail. We just want to kind of subtract some detail from the silhouette of these bricks. So that's what minimum is going to provide us. We'll see that we're still keeping that nice kind of straight shape, but occasionally the brick will dip in just a little bit like it's been chipped away or kind of eroded. We can also go and play around with the intensity. So if I go and set this to something like 120, right, we're getting just a little bit more intense slope blurring. Now, the caveat with this slope blur is that um, as soon as you start to apply it on everything, it really starts to uh, kind of amplify that procedural component or that procedural aspect of your materials. So I only want to really apply this on a select couple of bricks, not all of them across our entire texture. You can see that, um, you know, we're starting to kind of get this repeating noise texture. I can kind of tell that this is procedural. So let's take a look at creating a mask. So from our uh, brick blend just back here, I'm going to go ahead and drag this out and type in flood fill. So flood fill, if you're unfamiliar, is going to find uh, pretty much individual components of your texture that you uh, input into this node and create useful information from that. So if I click on this and I go ahead and I turn off the uh, paint checkerboard for our alpha, you can see that it's given each one of these bricks its own kind of like UV coordinates. So if I come back down here, you'll see that it even provides a flood fill uh, RGBA output. And if I take this out and I start to type in flood fill, there's a whole bunch of different flood fill options. Um, if you're coming from something like designer and you're wondering if there's a flood fill, uh, there's a lot of flood fill stuff. So chances are you're going to find what you're looking for. Now, one cool thing that uh, Instamat does have that you kind of have to, uh, you can make it in designer, but you have to use a couple notes to do this is the flood fill to mask note. So what I can do is select this, right? It's going to give me all those bricks as grayscale, you know, binary mask, but I can change the density so that I can create kind of like a random mask of bricks and use this for, uh, you know, only selecting a handful of these. If you were to do something like this in designer, you'd have to use a uh, flood fill, flood fill to random grayscale. And then you would have to use like a histogram scan and scan through, and then you change the contrast and stuff. Um, we just get this out of the gate here with this flood fill to mask. Now, one thing I would like to make sure about our flood fill here, and actually I'll probably view this, but select our flood fill, is I just wanna make sure that the threshold is um, a little lower so that we're kind of encompassing the entire brick. And actually maybe I'll just set it to zero there so that we wanna make sure we're just selecting kind of the brick entirely there. Actually, if I kind of swap back and forth between these and I think we're doing all right, perfect. So now how do we use this, right? After our slope blur, I'm going to create another blend. In the foreground, what I would like to have is that slope blur. So anywhere that's, you know, painted white in our mask is going to be a slope blurred area. And anything that's black is going to result in whatever we plug into the background. And actually I'm noticing maybe we're gonna get a couple errors if we have the threshold that low. So maybe if we do something like 0 0.1, there we go. So to plug in the remaining uh, useful data for us here, 
Let's take the blend that we are drawing all this information from, plug that into the background. And now if I go and plug this mask into that opacity mask down at the bottom of our uh, three sockets there, you'll see that uh, it's not too drastic of a change, but if I just kind of control Z and control Y, flip back and forth, you can see that we're adding and removing um, you know, some of those areas so that it's not just a uniformly slope blurred map. So this is a way that we can start to introduce some variety um, into our height map here so that we're not getting the same kind of uh, noise across every brick. So that's looking really good. I'm pretty satisfied with that. So next up on our plate, I'd like to go ahead and just slope blur a little bit more of our bricks here to kind of add some extra wear and tear to it. So after our final blend, let's go and look for another slope blur node. And this time for our height, I'm gonna be using a uh, Voronoi noise. And first and foremost, let's really crank up the scale here to something like, what do I have in my notes? Looks like I have something around 73. You can see that's a pretty uh, noisy texture there. Let's go and bring up the sample count to uh, 32. And actually that's something I failed to do for our uh, previous slope blur. So if we come on back and bring the sample count up to 32, just to increase the overall quality of it. I'm going to change the uh, mode of our slope blur again down to minimum so that we're just decreasing from our values. We're not really introducing any uh, sloping outside or like outwards from these shapes. And I'm going to decrease the intensity down to something like 1%. You can see here's the difference of 0 and 1. It's very, very subtle, uh, but it really does a good job if we look in our. Uh, 3D view here as well, something like zero and one, just really does a good job at chipping away from uh, all these bricks. And now this is something I think I'm going to want to carry across uh, all of our bricks here. Um, so I'm not going to try and mask this off like we just did previously, because uh, I think it's something that you would realistically see on, uh, you know, every single brick that you're encountering. So that's looking really good. I'm going to quickly run this through a levels node. And the reason that is, is a little later on, we're going to be kind of adding and removing and playing around with values that aren't going to work as well if our bricks are um, as kind of like at a higher range as they are currently. If we take a look at this levels node here, we can see that most of the brick detail uh, in our histogram here is towards the brighter end of the image. You can see that like all these bricks, right? are very high in their uh, pixel value. And then uh, the rest of them are pretty much just black. You can see that, um, you know, we've got a spike in the lower levels of our histogram. So what I want to do with this levels node, you know, kind of plain and simply is take our output and just drag this down to, you know, something around like 80%. So we've just gone from a pretty bright image down to something that's a little bit uh, more mid gray to you know upper mid gray this is just going to make it easier for us in a minute here when we start to um, kind of add and subtract some more detail so now that we have that all set up what i'd like to go ahead and do is add yet another blend as we're going to be adding and removing some of that detail like i just mentioned let's make sure to go and swap this into the background and uh, I don't know about you guys watching, but if you're familiar with Substance Designer, when you're adding blends, it adds it to the background. So it's, it's taking a lot of muscle memory on my part to um, you know, add these blends and then uh, recognize that it's going into the foreground, not the background. It's just kind of a little, a little gotcha moment um, of transferring software knowledge. But anyways, that's a bit of a side tangent because the grunge that I want to put into the foreground here is called Smudged Dirt. So if we take a look at this in our 2D view, we'll see that it's just a bunch of random kind of values and pockets of areas. And this is going to be how we're introducing some of those very micro kind of uh, dirt uh, scuffs and chips of the bricks 
that are very localized to specific regions. They're not really uh, something that's going to permeate much farther than just its immediate area. So I'll stop talking and start showing uh, realistically what this is going to result in. If we take a look and I go and switch our blending mode from default to subtract, right, is starting to remove some of these like scuffs in the brick. Now a couple different things. One, the intensity is way too high. So I'll change the opacity from 100% to uh, not 200%, 20%. And that's looking a lot better. However, I would like to go and uh, use a mask as well to kind of mask off some of these areas so that we're not just getting all of these chips across all the bricks everywhere. So another cool way we can do this is by using a histogram select. If I can spell histogram correctly, there we go, histogram select. And again, if we're familiar with the idea of histogram select from designer, we can actually specify a particular uh, range of values within the input image. And we're going to be able to use this to drive in a mask for us here. So I'm going to go and select the uppermost portion of our bricks, right? The more exposed areas um, that are going to be higher up and kind of popping out of our bricks a little bit more. And then we play around with uh, the, the range and the factor of these. So bump up our range, maybe the factor. And then we can even play around again with the intensity, maybe something like 30. Um, it's really going to depend on the look that you're going to want to go for, but I like these to be a little bit uh, more subtle. So I think I'm going to be pretty satisfied uh, with what we have here. All right. Well, I don't know about you, but um, I'm feeling 22. I'm also interested in moving on to the next portion of our material where we're going to be looking at that mortar that's coming kind of out from in between the bricks. So before we get there, I would like to go ahead and organize um, our graph here a little bit. Now, fortunately, we've been working pretty linearly up until this point uh, with our height map. So it's, it's kind of relatively easy to read the flow of what we have here. But as you're working with more complicated projects, chances are you're going to want to keep well organized, especially if you're also working with other people, um, to kind of comment out and frame a bunch of areas that are a certain component of your final material. So in this instance, I'm going to select all of these. Again, shift and then left click and drag to select all of this. You can see what we have um, in our selection here. And actually we get a bunch of uh, statistics for everything we have selected, which is kind of neat. And I'm going to go ahead and press shift and C to create a comment. Now in Instamat, um, a comment is also a frame. It frames your selection and then you can provide comments on it. Um, they're kind of one in the same. I don't think you can get a comment without a frame, but you can have a frame without commenting anything in it. So that's something to be aware of. So now if I go and select this comment frame here, I can give this a name. So I'll call this bricks. And you'll see that that's going to give me a title here. And then I can even double click to uh, provide it a description. So something along the lines of our little brick generator that could smiley face. And that's also going to show up kind of in the top here. So it gives you a bit of a description as to what is uh, kind of going on with this area. And then you can go ahead and click and drag and move this around just to help you keep it uh, really organized. You also have a bunch of different uh, options. You can change the color. Um, you can even do a custom color if you want. I'm just going to leave it at default. You can turn off the title, turn off the description, and so on and so forth. And you even have these shortcut hotkeys. Now, depending on how many comments and frames you have in your scene, this may be more or less useful. If I go ahead and add just another comment over here and say I was working on you know, a different part of my graph, and this was a really useful area, and I wanted to swap between these. This is where these hotkeys will come into play. So if I go ahead and hit Alt and 1, you can see that it's, uh, it's kind of framed this first comment here. Uh, because it's so long and so wide, um, it's framing everything, so that's why it didn't really look like uh, the view moved. But if I hit Alt 2, 
you can see now I've gone and framed this second comment here. So this is a great way to jump around your graph if you can remember which comments and frames have what hotkeys. You can also go ahead and change this to be uh, anywhere from zero to nine, and you can even have it unassigned. So it's um, you don't have the ability to jump to this. It's just a frame that you can use for organization. So let's continue on now with that second kind of height map that I was talking about with our mortar. So what I'm going to do is right click, let's type in blend height. If I can type height correctly. There we go. Blend height. And this is going to work similar to how a blend node would. And I mean, we could ultimately achieve this same look with a blend node, uh, but this is going to have a couple of different outputs that are uh, useful for this particular type of blending because we're trying to ultimately blend two height maps together, but keep them distinct from one another. Whereas previously we had been using grunges to kind of wear down the uh, height map underneath and use them almost as like layers and filters for um, achieving this final result with the brick. What the blend height is going to be is uh, a way for us to combine these two height maps we're creating as their own separate uh, kind of identities here. And so what I'm getting at is this uh, node also provides us with the idea of a mask output. So you can see where uh, these kind of bumps are from the height map that uh, just kind of is indeed the default bottom socket here. It's overpowering our bricks here and thus creating a mask where those two kind of intersect and um, one overpowers the other. This is going to be useful for later on when we start to actually color this material. So first, let's also go and swap the input parameters because I want to have the mortar on top and bricks underneath. Now, it doesn't really matter um, whichever one you put it in because you'll be able to play around with kind of the offsets here in the slider. But just in my head, this is kind of how it makes sense, right? The bricks are kind of this foundation of our material. So to kick things off, let's go and add yet another grunge. And this time I'm going to use Clouds Smooth. We can see that there. And let's plug this into the top. And with this height blend, what I'd like to do is just, let's just set the top offset uh, all the way, actually, what we'll do is instead of that, we'll set the bottom offset all the way to zero. That way uh, we can see just what we're doing with this here alone and on our 3D as well. So we're not focused on whatever the bricks are doing as of this point. So I want to get some more uh, larger shapes into this noise here. And one way we can do that is by, again, creating a slope blur. So let's go and create this slope blur node, All right? We can see some larger shapes taking form. And what I'd like to do is actually run this through kind of itself. So we're using itself as a guide or the direction to start to slope. And uh, just a quick little side tangent here on how that actually kind of works. We can see that we have a bunch of these larger shapes, right? Like we've got this little kind of billow here, maybe some of this shape here. So by and large, we have a really useful gradient map to kind of help us inflate these shapes based off of a lot of these larger gradients uh, that we can see in this noisy texture. So the way we can do that is by running this through a blur node so that we get rid of that micro detail. We're just capturing a lot of that larger sloped information. And then I can plug this into the height. So now you can see that we've gone from something like this to something that's um, a little bit more inflated um, and have kind of these like bulbous larger shapes. Now let's go and play with the scale of this. Uh, something like four is a little too low. I did something like around 25, right? So you start to get um, some pretty intense uh, inflation. It kind of looks like intestines or brains or something like that. So this is maybe a good basis for a material like that. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I'm also gonna come to our slope blur change the sample count up to 32. I'm going to change the mode down to average and let's set the intensity to around 50%. So again, we're getting that larger shape, but um, it's looking a little less uh, intestine-y, intestine I, I don't know, small colony. Um, <laughs> it's looking a, a little less guttural. 
So this is going to be a pretty good for, uh, you know, the basis of our mortar here. So I'd like to continue adding some noise to this here. So let's bring our height blend all the way back over there. And now what I'm going to do is run this through a guided blur. So the guided blur is kind of cool because it's, it works kind of similar to like a slow blur or just a regular blur. But again, we're using um, a different type of input map to drive some of these calculations. And you can see that we actually utilize this as more of an angle input to slope across um, the gradient height map input. Again, I'm not entirely certain the overall difference, but it does operate differently uh, than our slope blur here. So I'm going to then search for another node, which is called liquid noise. This is a really cool uh, kind of warped procedural texture, which has just got uh, kind of these like scraggly, almost liquidy, you know, hence the name watery type of grayscale grunge information. So let's plug this into our angle input. And by and large, it's not looking great. Um, at default, the first thing I'd like to do is change the scale of our liquid down to around six, kind of, you know, smooth it out a little bit. And then in our guided blur, what I'd like to do is I'm going to change the intensity down to around 2.25. So something really light. And you can kind of hopefully see what's starting to take shape here as we're getting some of that more kind of like speckled like hand plane look where it's dried and kind of tiered off like you'll see with like concrete and cement and like mortar in between the bricks and i'm going to change the uh, blend mode as well from average to minimum so it's going to uh, kind of cut away and actually let's go back to average here yeah you'll be able to play around with some of these features actually because i kind of think all three look cool but i'm going to stick with minimum so that it's going to give us some of that uh, kind of jut in look for uh, some of these areas here, like it's been tiered like concrete does. All right, and so the next thing I'd like to take a look at is going to be uh, adding a little bit more surfacing detail to some of this mortar here. And it's just gonna be quite uh, kind of a light blend to add on top. So after our guided blur, let's add a blend node and swap those around so that we have our uh, foreground open. And what I'm going to use this time is just another grunge called uh, Dense, not Denoise. I can't read my own writing here. Dense Noise. And I think I used the second option here. It's a little bit bigger. Uh, so it's not too crazy, like high frequency. And we'll plug that in. And if you take a look at the noise here, right, we can see that with the um, the default, we're getting a bunch of like larger shapes, right? More recessed areas, higher areas, and we're getting some of that larger scale clouds noise into this. Which again, for this, I don't really want to introduce. I just want kind of that higher frequency noise. So a node that we can use to kind of cancel out a lot of these larger scale and just keep the high frequency is called a high pass. So on top, let's go and start to type in high pass. We see that this is an image filter. And we'll see that we go from something like this to something more like this, right? We still get some of that larger scale detail, but um, we by and large remove a lot of it and just keep that higher frequency stuff. So now I can go and tweak the blending mode here to something a little bit more appropriate. So I uh, used hard light here in my kind of testing, right? So we kind of overlay it on top uh, of the background texture there. And I'm also going to decrease the intensity to something like 13. So if we take a look, right, uh, I'm looking in my 3D view here, this is a value of zero. And this is something like, uh, maybe I'll bump it up to 15. So just adding a little bit more of that noise to our image here. It's a little tough to see uh, in our grayscale 2D view here, just because of how small that actual contribution is. And then I'll go ahead and just really kind of inflate our values here using a levels node. So with this node, let's go and just pump up the 
mid value here to make everything kind of brighter overall. And I'll do around like 20, 28, maybe 27.8, something like that. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're not uh, capping any of those values out. And I don't think we are. Now, if I go back to our height blend here and take a look, and I reset this, we'll notice that we're getting some more interesting detail in the kind of crevices of the bricks, but it's not really conforming very well. And it's also showing up kind of in the middle of these bricks, which uh, is not ideal, right? Like if I, even if I play around with the top uh, offset, or I guess maybe the bottom offset here, right? Um, it's not really ideal for uh, blending these two together. So what we have to do is go ahead and in our uh, kind of mortar area here, create a bit of a mask. Um, we could also go and create a mask and plug it in here, but I kind of like to bake it into um, our mortar height up here. So that way we're not getting any kind of like harsh lines between uh, these two. I just find it gets a little too contrasted when we're using a mask in the blend. Um, I'd rather kind of bake it into our levels here. But how do we go ahead and start to create this mask, right? So let's come on back to where we had this blend here. I'm going to create another reroute image node here. Maybe just drag this inside. And I'm going to drag this off and down. And let's use a histogram select node. So we're already familiar with this. We've used this before. What this is going to allow us to do is grab a specific range within this image that's our input image and kind of just target that area. And now the area that I want to target is going to be these kind of black background areas. This is the area where we're starting the kind of basis of our mask. So I'm going to drag this all the way down because, you know, position of zero is um, kind of that range, of that value range that we want to select. And then I'm going to go ahead and start to blur this just a little bit. I don't need it to be too crazy. Uh, something like maybe 12% so that we're uh, just kind of making sure that we're removing a lot of any uh, like higher uh, frequency noise. So now let's quickly just run this through a reroute node. I'm going to bring this over. And on top of my levels, um, actually just on the connection there, there we go. Let's add a blend. Let's go and just swap that so that we can plug our mask into the foreground. And let's go ahead and just multiply this. So now we're taking that mortar that we created, multiplying it so that it's going to kind of blend in where that mask is. So that now we're blending this image here as our mortar and it's going to sit nicely within those bricks. So if you're happy with just kind of a, um, you know, not too grungy type of mortar, you could probably just tweak this a little bit and then you'd be happy to go. But we have to do a little bit more destruction and damage to this mask because um, this is not grungy whatsoever, right? These are just conforming nicely to the brick. Uh, we really didn't even need a height blend node for, you know, to make this work. So let's come on back and we're going to start destroying this mask a little bit and adding some wear to it. So first and foremost, let's go and use a directional warp. And this is going to make it kind of topsy-turvy. Um, the default that we have plugged in uh, just to the node in general is a noise.png. Um, not ideal for this type of grunge, so we're going to have to use something a little more custom. So in our intensity, let's go and select clouds heavy. Again, I believe we've already used this once before. And I'm going to change the frequency gain all the way up to a value of 1. I'm going to change the frequency smooth to around 0.42. And then coming on over to our directional warp, I'm actually going to uh, change the direction just to a value of one so that we're not blurring it in multiple directions. We're only going to blur it in one. And that direction is going to be down, right? Because we have our kind of mortar pushing over the sides of these bricks and then moving in a southbound or, you know, kind of like downwards 
direction. So by default, the uh, angle is set to zero, and I believe it's set uh, to the left if uh, at a value of zero. So if we set it to 270, now it should actually kind of work downwards. Um, it's a little tough to see right now because the intensity is so high, but if I drag this down and then start to drag it up, you can see that at a value of 270, it's going to kind of like blur it downwards. So I think an intensity of around 0.1 worked well. And now so far, it's not looking great. It's kind of functionally working how we wanted to, but um, we need to go and change the trail mode. And this is what's really useful about this directional warp is we can take the original image that we have input, warp it to something like this, and we can get all the values in between uh, those two areas. All we have to do is go ahead and change the trail mode to a value of maximum, and then change the trail length to a value of one, so that now we're kind of getting right that in between there. And I don't want to have any trail fade. So now, as soon as I take this down, you can see that we're getting uh, effectively kind of like a drooped mask, right? We're getting that area in between the cracks, and then we're also getting some overlap on top of each one of these bricks as if the mortar is drooping over. Now that's starting to look okay, but it really isn't conforming to uh, kind of the shape that we've created up top here for the mortar, something like this, right? So what I'd like to do is a little bit uh, kind of right before the end here, I'm gonna add a slope blur node. And then I'm gonna grab something maybe like this guided blur and go ahead and use this as the height for our slope blur. So now we're kind of cross feeding these two streams here, right? Where we're using the original mortar shape to blur out a mask, which we're then going ahead and blending back in to that original mortar shape to create this more organically shaped mask that kind of fits the details that we've generated. Now the slope blur again is pretty intense. It's kind of crazy. We don't need it to be that crazy. So let's bring the intensity down to about 15%. And I'm gonna set the uh, mode to average so that we're going to, if I just take a look at our 2D, right, we're getting something that's just kind of noisy like that, not really conforming to uh, the mortar shape, to something that's a little bit more scuffed and detailed like that. So now if we've been following along, this is hopefully going to result in a much easier kind of uh, convincing blend here. So I'm gonna set the top opacity back to around 0.5, and I'm gonna take the bottom opacity uh, down just a little bit. Remember the bottom is our bricks. And maybe I'll set this to like 0.25. And hopefully we can start to see a lot of this mortar now starting to kind of drip over top of our bricks here. And we can go back and play around with some of these parameters like our directional warp intensity to really kind of change how far down these droop if we take a look real quick. So you can see that as I start to uh, increase this, we start to get more or less droop. And we're gonna be taking a look much later in this video as to how we can actually create a parameter from this and increase the flexibility if we were to hand this material off to somebody so that they can play around with this on the fly and they don't even need to come into this graph to find the node that does that. Alrighty, so that is our time together here for the height map. Uh, if you've made it this far without too many issues and you're, you know, you've got something that looks kind of like this and you're satisfied with it, like props to you. Um, this has not been light on content. I'll you know, be the first one to admit it. Hopefully I haven't lost you or confused you too much yet. And this is really not easy stuff. Like this is over years of my experience kind of culminating in this project to kind of make it as simple as possible as I'm showing you how to create something like this. So with all that said, if it's kind of making sense to you, if you haven't ever touched materials before, or if you're coming from another application, and this is starting to kind of make sense in your head, uh, that's really all that matters. So awesome job. Let's keep going with that momentum. We're gonna be taking a look at finalizing our material here with a couple of uh, channel 
outputs like our color, roughness, we'll tweak the normals a little bit. And we're going to look at how we can do all of that right now. So let's move on over to our outputs. And the first one I want to look at, and I usually look at, is our color because we can draw a lot of extra smaller scale surface information based on the types of colors we want to contribute to our base color. So I'm going to drag out a pin here and I'm going to look for gradient map. And this is going to allow us to start to color our image based on the input gradient that we provided. So it's going to take the black to white values in this image here, and it's going to map the colors based on this slider. So I'm going to quickly just uh, populate a couple of these points. Um, I can just go and uh, click the little plus there, add a point or remove it, and then you can change the color uh, down here. Now it doesn't need to be a grayscale. If I go and just uh, deselect this, now we're actually getting a color output here. So I can go ahead and uh, select one of these, click on the color, make sure the saturation is up, and we can start to color this uh, a bunch of different colors. So I have a gradient off screen that I want to use, and I'm quickly going to just go and uh, eyedropper that. So I've gone ahead and just quickly plugged in our gradient map here now to our base color output. So we're going to be able to see this on our uh, 3D view here. Now you're welcome to go ahead, pause the video, and just start to uh, select each one of these points um, and move them in a similar fashion. But the idea is that uh, we're just using, and actually I might go ahead and just decrease the value of this one here a little bit. We're just trying to create uh, some variation in the color ranges across the grayscale input image that we provided this node here. Now with that, let's go ahead and actually start to randomize some of these brick values a little bit more. It's already doing that based off of the uh, grayscale that we provided it, but I would like to do this on a more uh, per brick level as opposed to relying on just a random gradient to do that. So what I'd like to do is come on all the way back to before we added that grout. And we're going to go and create effectively a mask from this that we can start to select those bricks. So let's drag out a flood fill node again from this. And I'll maybe decrease the threshold just a little bit so we're getting most of the brick. That's looking good. And I'm going to bring this over. Now, I don't want this kind of random cord kind of going through all of my materials as I bring this over. So another way we can organize our graphs, much like Designer, is if I hold down Alt and I click on that uh, connection noodle, you can see that it's given me this little temporary uh, reroute socket. Now, the caveat with this, is that you can't, uh, as far as I know, connect this to anything. You can see that as I'm clicking, you would expect it to drag out another connection line, much like a uh, designer, but this is only for kind of one connection line. Otherwise, you're going to be using these reroute image nodes. So let's just drag this over. I got to zoom in a little bit again. Drag this over here like that. And then we can bring this over. Let's go and blend these together now. And again, swapping our inputs here, so that we can plug the flood fill into our blend. You'll see that it does work. We're getting two color images, but you'll notice that we're getting this little uh, error on our connection line here. Now it is working, but we are getting a bit of a warning, I should say, not an error. So the first thing you'll notice as we plug this in is that we're getting this little kind of like warning sign on this connection. Now it is working. If we take a look, right, we can see those kind of UV uh, planes overlaid on top of our bricks. But if I click on this connection socket, you'll see that as you're building up your connections and your node networks, from time to time, you're going to have these types of graph warnings. And this is going to tell us kind of what's going on here. We can see that it's a color space mismatch. So the source, which is this flood fill, 
color space uses linear, which does not match the destination, which is sRGB. So we don't have to worry about that really, but I just wanted to showcase that from time to time, you're gonna see these pop up. And I actually even believe we have one uh, down here with our normal map, which I didn't address earlier on just because I wanted to kind of wait. Um, but you can see, right, semantic requires usage of normal map tangent, but no semantic usage is specified for the destination. So again, it's not really throwing an error. It's working as intended, but sometimes, depending on the nodes and how they are actually constructed, uh, behind the scenes. There might be better scenarios on how you'd want to use these, or you might have a mismatch of things like color space to just be aware of. Now, in the case of our normal map, doesn't really matter for this application. And for this application here, uh, we're not finishing off with a flood fill. What I'd like to do is run this through a, another flood fill to random color uh, to color. There we go to color, something like this. And now if we go and plug this in, that should uh, correct that for us. Now we can see we're getting each individual brick popping up. Um, I'll notice that uh, we're getting maybe some error in there. So I might wanna bump up uh, the threshold just a little bit. Not that it really matters, we're going to be recoloring the grout over top of it anyways, but just for, you know, uh, kind of completion sake, I guess. Now what I'd like to do, is actually swap this to be in grayscale mode because I'd like to go ahead if we view this here and actually it's not even going to let us view it until I disconnect that right we were having an issue where we were connecting a grayscale with a color image so if I just disconnect that briefly I want to get a bunch of these random kind of colors here and this is how we're going to start to tint and influence the color of each individual brick so now to connect this, I have to go back from grayscale. If I type in grayscale to color, it will now convert this back to an RGB image and I can plug that in. So now with our blend mode, let's go ahead, change the blend mode to color burn. And then I'm going to uh, drag the intensity or the opacity down to around something like 15%. So now we've gone from this original image here to something kind of like that, where each of the bricks are falling in line with uh, some of the established kind of brownish orange color, but they're each getting their own kind of color within that uh, close proximity of each other. And now if I wanted to go ahead and play around with, um, you know, varying up or moving around some of these, we can go and play with this flood fill to color. And if I come up to the instance properties and I play around with the seed, you'll be able to see that I can switch around a bunch of the colors, just kind of, you know, willy nilly all randomly. So that's a great way to get a bunch of variation in your bricks and your colors uh, with just a very simple slider. So now let's really get the ball rolling with our color. I'm going to continue along our chain here and add another blend node. And again, adding this to the background. So what I'd like to do here is take what we have and just add a bunch of ran random kind of grunginess to it. Uh, right now we're still kind of building up these layers and uh, with bricks, right? They're pretty dusty, they're pretty grungy. They are exposed to the elements and they're gonna receive a lot of that wear and tear on the surface. So I'm gonna add a uh, sloped fractal sum. If we take a look, this is gonna give us some kind of geometric and tiered shapes, but still it's gonna be kind of randomly noisy all across. I'm gonna drag this out and I'm gonna use a fractal. Again, if I can spell anything correctly in this series, a fractal warp node. So this is going to take all of that kind of structured information and really just create some more kind of random elements to this. There's really no uh, like method to what we're doing here. I'm just trying to create some very random noise uh, that's pretty scratchy. Now, instead of doing something like, just like a white noise that's random per pixel, I do want to try and keep a lot of these larger kind of areas where you can see if we zoom out, right? We're still getting the semblance of structure to this but at a very smaller level, we are getting some kind of wispy, um, like integration of different neighborhoods of pixels that are 
of varying intensity. And finally with that, I'm gonna run that through a sharpen node, which is another image filter uh, to just really crunch that up. And I'm gonna drag that, actually I'll just bring this back a little bit. I'm gonna drag that into our foreground here. And you'll see that uh, by default, that is going to go ahead and create this grayscale to color node. Um, the reason it didn't do it back here is I believe it was still kind of you know messed up with that flood fill that we had done earlier. But generally, as you plug in grayscale to blend nodes that are color, um, it's going to just automatically create this grayscale conversion node for you. So if we take a look now, right, we're getting a lot of that smaller, noisier grunge on the surface, but we're not going to just want to have that uh, kind of de facto over the entirety of our model or our texture, I should say. So let's change the blending to add and decrease the opacity down to like 25%. So it's just adding some noise across our bricks, right? And we're getting some of that kind of dusty look for our bricks here. Now, another feature for bricks that I've noticed is that they kind of have these splashes of solid color. Um, it's just kind of like moisture stains or something that's been slapped and localized to certain regions of bricks. So another grunge we're going to take a look at, and I'll move my base color output back a little bit more and add a blend node, is going to be moisture splash. So let's look for moisture. You can see that we have a bunch of like cool moisture grunges, but the one that I want to use is this moisture splash, right? Because we just have this kind of like splatter across our bricks. So in this instance, instead of using this as the grayscale input, I'm going to use this actually as a mask and plug that in. So we can kind of see what's going to happen here is it's going to kind of create these blotches on our material. However, I'm going to, again, swap the inputs. So we're going to make sure that this is in the background. And I'm just going to use a solid color for this. So let's start to type in solid color. Plug this into our foreground. And then I'm going to just quickly go and we drag this up to something like 0.8. So we're just getting a solid white color. And with the blend, what I'd like to do is set the blending mode to overlay. So overlay is going to take whatever we have below it and kind of lighten it up a little bit. It's going to keep it within the same kind of um, like hue range and just increase its value. Again, not very technical uh, with the type of blending operations it's doing. So please do not flame me in the comments about how technically, factually, that was super incorrect because. I'm already aware how stupid I am. Don't worry. So I'm finding that's a little bit too intense. So let's also drag the opacity down to around, uh, oh, maybe 20 is a little too low. Let's try 25, I think. And let's move our environment around again. I keep flip-flopping between these two environments because I can never decide what I like. I think that's starting to come along all right. And we can even play with this actual moisture splash if we wanted to double uh, the amount of splashes we had to something like 16, right? That's just going to be more noise that we have on our model. Um, you can even play around with the amount of spread. So if you want to have bigger blotches, smaller blotches, and just kind of grow that noise. I think I had something like 0.4 in mine. I'm starting to think that's coming along pretty good. Next up on our list of things to get done with the color is a little more involved. Albeit, I'm going to run through it a little slow so that we can get comfortable with the idea of what we're doing. So ultimately, what I'd like to start doing is using some of the curvature uh, information and features of the height map to drive some of the coloring. Right now, we've just kind of been splashing some colors to get something down. But now I'd like to use the actual features of our material uh, to start creating some of this. So let's go back down to our normal map here. I'm going to drag this all the way back so it's kind of a before there. And we'll see that with normal maps, we are going to be able to use a particular kind of node. So I'm going to drag this out and I'm going to start to type in curve.
curvature. So we'll see that we have a normal to curvature two node. So when I select that, we take a look, right? We're going to get a grayscale mask essentially for us to use for different aspects of our bricks here. So I can change the radius down to make it a little sharper. You can even change the sharpness of this. I can even maybe swap this up to something like two. It's gonna tell me that I'm about to change the maximum range from one to two, but that's okay. I can just hit yes. And Instamat has let me do that. So we're not even stuck to a range of zero to one. We can go beyond that and even beyond that in the opposite direction. Now, some of these sliders, it might not make sense, uh, but in this instance, right, if I go to three and hit yes, you can see we're getting even sharper and sharper. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to take our normal to curvature. I'm gonna go and blend this together. And I'd like to actually take the concave area and subtract it from this here. So what is that gonna look like? If I go and swap these, I'm gonna take the concave and put it in the foreground. And if I go and subtract, right? Here's what we had before. And here's what we have after. I would like to do in the same process. So let's go ahead and actually take the output of this and blend it. I'm going to put this in the background and take the convex mask now and subtract this. Let's go ahead and subtract so that we're starting to get something like this. The reason I'm doing this is I don't want to find the concave or the convex areas. I would like to find the in-between values of the kind of like surface planar faces. And I can go and play around with the values here maybe to uh, decrease the sharpness or we can play around with the radius to uh, better find that as well. But what we're essentially creating here is just a mask to help us kind of find those planar faces. So now if I run this through a levels node and I really crush these values, I am now starting to find those kind of in-between values. So let's go and add a blend and swap these over, plug this in as our mask. Right here is kind of what our mask is looking like. And I'm gonna go and just quickly drag this solid color in, plug that in on top. And let's go and change the blending mode of this to be divide. So now, hopefully, if we can kind of take a look here. This is a value of zero, and here's a value of one. So we're just creating these kind of like dusty, scuffed surfaces. And if I go and change the curvature radius to make it sharper, to make it a little blurrier, we can change the sharpness value of this to maybe make it a little softer or a little sharper, we're gonna be able to uh, really easily tweak our mask just from this node here. Now, another way you could kind of accomplish this, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail on it, is if we go from our normal map here, we drag this out, and we start to type in facing. You'll see that we also have another node that we could use called facing normal, which allows us to kind of achieve the same thing, I go and take out a levels node here and really crush up these values to something like this. You'll see that we kind of achieve the same thing. Maybe I shouldn't uh, drag that up. Here we go. But we can drag these black values. But you'll notice that we don't have as much control with uh, this node here like we do the curvature. So that's the reason I went ahead and used uh, this more convoluted route is that this doesn't really have a lot uh, that we can play around with. But that's going to allow us to create this really cool looking mask here. And again, we've just gone and added another layer of that detail. You can even start to see some of those swoops um, coming in, those swipes and those wipes, right, from earlier in the video that are being introduced now into the color of the bricks. So that's going to conclude our uh, like individual work on the bricks. Let's go ahead and now combine this 
with the start of our grout and start to combine all of this together to really make it a lot more grounded. Right now it looks cool, but we're obviously missing a major component of what this material is. So let's go and add another blend. And you're probably gonna to wanna to get comfortable with adding blends because they're pretty much a majority of what uh, texturing is in a node-based software. And we're gonna to wanna to make sure that's in the background. So I'm gonna come on all the way back to when we have that uh, blend height where we blended together the mortar and the brick. And now is when I'm going to draw upon that mask that we generated. And that's why, again, I used this particular node as it is really uh, handy for generating this type of information. So let's drag this all the way over to our socket here. Now, uh, make sure that you're clicking and dragging. As far as I know, you can't just single click and then release and just have the socket. You actually have to drag it over. Again, if any developers are watching, it would be really awesome if I could just single click on it, especially if I already have the um, double click set to uh, viewing the node in 2D. So I'm not going to be single clicking on the outputs necessarily. But again, there's probably a legitimate reason why that's not the case just makes it really difficult to drag sockets in. Let's go and drop this into the opacity mask. And we can see, right, pretty easily, we're able to uh, mask this whole area off. So now let's actually provide it with some useful gradient information. And again, I'm going to just Alt and click to create a clean kind of socket there. And what I'm gonna do is, find this gradient that we created. Oh, I was really hoping duplicating it would also duplicate the connection. I guess not. Um, actually, no, hold on. This is a good learning moment. What I can do is hold down Alt and then left click and drag. And ah, there we go. See, I've created a nice duplicate that's also kept the, collect, uh, the connection. So again, Alt and left click. That's something I just learned recently too. So I'm actually kind of glad I got to use that. Now that's kind of funny. So let's drag this over wherever we have our blend here and drag the output into our foreground. Now, again, that's going to destroy everything we just did, but that's okay because we're also going to change everything that we just did. So again, I'm going to just off uh, my screen here, kind of create a little bit of a gradient. So I'll be back real quick. Sweet, so I am creating a gradient that looks something like this. Again, if you wanna kind of drag your eyedropper, here you go. And that's going to be a pretty good basis for us here. We're getting some of that kind of grayish color into it, but I've also kind of added some yellowish component to it to kind of make it look dirty. If you haven't guessed by now, we're really leaning into that grungy, dirty vibe. So that's going to result in something that looks kind of like this. And now you can hopefully kind of see your bricks and the detail on them a little bit better now that we've kind of separated them like that. And what's really cool is because we're using this height blend mask, if I'm to go ahead and just change whatever blending that we have for this, say I wanted the, uh, the bricks to come out a little bit more, it's going to update this mask accordingly so that we have it blending just kind of like harmoniously with the rest of our uh, color textures here. So that's really cool how we've set this up. So back to our color here. Let's go ahead and add some more curvature detail to our texture entirely. We're going to be doing this across the entire uh, mortar and brick, so we don't need to mask anything else off between these two uh, height maps. So let's add another blend. And this one is going to rely on, again, our curvature. Now I'm going to uh, drag out a new one so that we're not um, combining the mask for these faces here with the mask for some of the curvature that we're doing. So we wanna keep these separate. And I'm gonna plug in the concavity to the mask here. Swap these around. And let's go and drag a solid color out of thin air by typing in solid color. And let's plug that in. 
So this is going to be some of those cavity areas, right? The concave parts of our curvature. I am going to quickly just grab a color off screen again, which is just around 0 0.1 on our slider for the value there. And let's go and hit subtract. So you'll see what we've done here is we've gone from really kind of no crevice information to a little bit more just by really subtracting a solid color based off of our curvature uh, concavity mask here. Now we're going to do pretty much the same, but inverted. So let's go and add another blend. Let's take the convex. So this is going to be the edges now. Plug that into our opacity. I'm going to uh, control D to duplicate this. Plug it in. And quickly, I'm going to off screen again, grab a more uh, brighter color. You can see that it's uh, more towards the bright end of our color value. And with this, what I'd like to do is change the blending mode to be overlay. Now, I maybe want to bring the value of this up a little bit more. There we go. So you'll see that we're starting to get some of that color information right in some of the more uh, convex areas of our bricks here. Now I'm finding that it's maybe a little too soft. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just drag our radius down a little bit so that we're getting something a little bit more like that, right? So now we're starting to get some of those edge highlights uh, on these bricks here, which is looking pretty cool. And now the last thing we're going to be looking at for our color output is just adding an extra element of grunge or dust or uh, like cavity dirt buildup, right? Something would be collecting in the crevices of these bricks and it would probably be uh, contributing some color as well as some other channel outputs, which we'll look at here in a minute. So if I start to type in dust and we take a look, I believe it is material mask dust. We take a look down here. We can see that we have a couple of different inputs. And this is going to be the kind of general idea, right? We're getting in these kind of ambient occlusion, concavity areas, this kind of dusty, dirty mask buildup. But we need a couple of input parameters first. So I'm going to drag this all the way back to where we have our height. So let's plug that in. We also need to plug in an ambient occlusion. So if we go on over to our ambient occlusion, take a look at that and plug that in, you'll see that we're starting to really build this up. We can also take a look at our normal. So let's go ahead. I just want to make sure I can see both of them. Plug that into the normal. There we go. So that is going to allow us to create this generator mask that's going to kind of fulfill this uh, dust requirement here. And making sure, yep, we've got everything included. So let's add uh, one last blend, swap the parameter inputs, and drag this mask into our opacity. So there we go. Now, what I'd like to do is add one more solid color into our foreground. I am quickly going to grab yet another color off screen just because I have all these colors already uh, set up to a way I like them. And we are going to uh, just leave the blending mode as it is. But we're going to come down and tweak our mask here. So we can play around with the amount of dust right which is just kind of on the surface um, i think i'm going to leave it as is and we can play around with maybe some of the ambient occlusion intensity uh let's see what does our normal intensity do kind of yeah i'm probably going to leave that at default we can also play around with the balance of this grunge if we want a little bit more say like 0.4 and the contrast if we, you know you had a really like sharp contrasted dirt I kind of like the idea of a more uh, like blurred and blended in dirt. 
um, just so it's not overpowering, but to each their own, depending on what you need. Um, and I think take my dust level down. I might want to put my dust level at around something like 0.35. So it's not uh, crazy overpowering, but there are areas where uh, you get more buildup than others. So I think that's looking pretty good. And the final kind of uh, cherry on top is I generally like to just run this through a light sharpen. So you'll see that that's pretty intense. Um, gives it that kind of like embossed look. That's not what we want. I'm going to take a look at maybe dropping this down to like 5%. So we can see the difference is just a little bit. Might not even be able to see it on YouTube, actually. A little bit of added clarity here. And honestly, for a base color, I'm pretty satisfied with what we have here. So now let's start adding some of these details we put in the color channel to contribute to some of the others. So the next one I want to be looking at is roughness. Now, uh, we don't actually have a roughness output yet. So that's something we can go and start to create. I'm going to uh, single click in my graph here and create a new parameter output. And again, it's going to be an element image gray because roughness is a grayscale uh, color channel. And let's go and rename this to roughness. And as I start to type it, you can see one of the variable names for our outputs here. So let's select roughness and we'll OK it. So now if we go ahead and come on back to our normal, let's drag out another curvature node from our normal here. And this is going to be how we're going to start our roughness. I generally start my roughness with a curvature because um, it's the most kind of up to date surface information that we can have to kind of start playing around with some of our, our roughness values. So let's go and just plug the output of this into our roughness value. And I believe now if I just kind of quickly add a levels here and start to play around with this, yeah, we should be able to uh, start to see this actually showing up in our 3D view. Again, if yours isn't, make sure that um, it's named correctly. I believe uh, Instamat is really specific about the naming. So you want to make sure that this is set to roughness. So I'm going to take a, another levels here. And let's go and just blend these together. And I'll tell you why in just a second, but let's make sure we get these situated here. And we'll plug that into our final one. So the reason that we had gone and created two levels here based off of our normal to curvature is that again, I am trying to kind of mask off the different areas between the bricks and our grout. Uh, generally, they're probably going to be relatively the same type of roughness, but I want the ability to set their base roughness um, different from one another. So what we're going to do is then draw a mask, come all the way back to our blend height, from this mask output. So let's go and drag this over. Probably miss our nodes because I can never see where I'm going when I'm doing this. I probably should have zoomed out more. There we go. Plug that into our opacity mask. So now as I start to tweak this, you see that we have completely independent control of one over the other. So for both of these, what I'm going to do is actually invert our outputs here so that um, we have uh, the more kind of like recessed areas our cavities as being uh, much rougher because they would accumulate more dirt in them right more grunge and grime and i'll do the same thing for this brick here and if we quickly take a look at moving some of these around um, I find that the bricks are going to be a little bit uh, smoother um, and not as rough. So we can do something like that. And then I am going to uh, actually decrease. Oh, that's the wrong one there. So increase the value of our grout so that they're not super shiny. Um, I'm even going to, now I get a little confused when I invert these. I want to make these brighter though. So if I do that. We can do something kind of like that. There we go. 
but play around with it, find something that works for you. So we've finished that part of our roughness, but I want to start contributing some of the actual color information that we've added as well. Specifically something like that dirt, right? That we had started to kind of build up in some of the crevices there. So let's move our roughness output back, add a blend node and swap those inputs because now I'm going to uh, start hunting for masks. Um, I'm going to be finding areas where that I've created masks, such as this dust one here. And I'm going to use that as the foreground of this blend. So coming on back down to our blend, what I want to use from this mask is that kind of brighter areas. And if we think about how a roughness mask works or a roughness map, the brighter areas are areas that denote rougher details. So this is perfect. I want to keep this brighter value and get rid of all this dark value. So the blending mode we can use for that is going to be screen. So you'll see the difference between before and after is just kind of roughening those areas in those cavities there. Now it doesn't need to be 100%. We can do something like maybe 60%. Uh, it doesn't need to be purely rough. But again, play around with it and find something that kind of works for uh, the overall look that you're going for here. And then finally, what we can also do is go up and find this mask that we created over here. And we can have it so that uh, various areas on these bricks are maybe rougher or glossier, depending on um, what kind of surface face value they are. So let's go and just add a, uh, not a bevel, a blend. I start to type in blend and I'll drag this back down to our roughness. I'm going to go ahead and add this before that dust mask that we just created. So I'll plug in that blend there and then plug this in before. And let's go ahead and zoom in on our uh, model here. And again, we can go ahead and maybe do something like screen to kind of rough up some of those more protruding areas. Now I find that it's really kind of overdoing it uh, for the grout. So that's something I'm going to go ahead and just grab our mask again from our blend height, making sure I'm close enough and plug that into our mask. Now in this instance, right, our mask is actually masking off the area for the grout. What's really cool about uh, Instamat is that we can actually, in this blend node, just invert that mask input. So we don't have to uh, invert the mask outside using maybe an invert node or something. We can actually do that here in the node. So if I just hit invert, now we can see that all it's doing is affecting those bricks. And then I'm going to just decrease the opacity to maybe something like 15%. So we're just getting very, very kind of subtle edge wear. So that is almost wrapping up our outputs here. The final channel that I'd like to take a look at is our normal. So, so far we've seen the ability to create a normal map from a height, but uh, we haven't done much else with it. What's really cool and handy about Instamat is that we can actually create multiple normal maps and start to combine them together. So not everything has to be kind of uh, crammed in here to our height here. And generally what I try and do is leave the larger scale information for my height map generation, and then leave some smaller kind of less essential detail for kind of blending into my normal map a little bit later on. So let's take a look at our normal map here. We can see we've got a lot of our information um, being driven by this map here. But what I'd like to do is maybe add a little bit more normal variation to uh, some of the bricks. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to search for stone noise. And we've seen, you know, this kind of pattern before, right? It's just a lot of geometric shapes that we can start to um, kind of overlay on top of these bricks. So let's go ahead, do a height to a normal node and create a normal map from that. And we can see right very familiar detail that we did uh, kind of towards the beginning of this video. And now what we can do with these two normal maps 
is go ahead and drag this out and do normal combine. And this is going to allow us to combine two normal maps together and it's going to um, just blend them correctly because normal maps are a little special, far beyond the <laughs> scope of this video, but blending them together is not as easy as just uh, putting them together and using something like multiply. So let's do a normal combine here. I'm going to plug in our uh, bricks into the base normal. And then I'm going to plug in our height to normal uh, down here as the detail normal. So you'll see that we go from something like this to something a little more detailed like this. Uh, now this is a little bit intense. I think what I'm going to do is drop this down to maybe like 0 0.2. So we can see that we're getting just a slight normal variance there. And I also, again, want to mask this off. So we're going back again to our blend height here, taking this mask that we've created and dragging that in. Now, again, you'll notice that uh, we'll have to invert that mask because if we recall, right, it's going to uh, mask off the bricks and only show the grout or the mortar. So let's invert the mask. And then I'm going to hold down control and drag that output to here so that we just quickly kind of update this connection. So let's take a look. What did we do? If I go ahead and just drop the opacity down to zero and then back up to 0.2, all I'm really doing is just adding a bit of normal information to our bricks. Now, the cool thing about this, and what's really powerful about uh, node-based networks, is because I've replaced this, this is now permeating to all of those other areas that we are using this normal map. So you'll see here, right, as we're creating uh, this curvature map, whereas we had this before, we now can go ahead and do something like this, and it's picking up that extra detail from this normal. Now, sometimes this might not be desirable, so you're gonna have to play around with how you're kind of blending these in the order that you're blending them together, but I think for this tutorial, it's gonna be more than okay. There we go, we've got some kind of destroyed brick normals that we've been able to combine with our normal map. Well, I wanna be the first to congratulate you for making it this far. Uh, this is probably a pretty long tutorial by this point, but we covered a lot of ground, and so hopefully you've got one or two things that have stuck with you throughout your time with me here. What I want to look at for the remainder of this video is just kind of consolidating uh, and cleaning up some of the outputs for this material, as well as exposing parameters that we can use outside of this material and other graphs. So if we were to go and create a new graph, uh, bring this one in, and then start playing around with some of the uh, properties that we have been using as we've been developing this material, we're going to have that ability. So first and foremost, let's go and clean up our outputs. So I'm gonna come on over to uh, our object property view here. And you'll see that we kind of have these all thrown around, just um, you know, kind of dependent on how we actually created them. So I'd like to generally convention kind of determines uh, that we start with our base color for nodes. So I'm gonna click and drag this to put it over top. And I'll do the same thing for the normal. I'm going to keep my colors together. Um, I'm probably going to do roughness next and then height and ambient occlusion. So that's fine there. Now, what I'd also like to do is you'll see that um, a couple of these had material, and but now they've all got default because I've moved them around. Um, what this is going to allow me to do is use this kind of lazy connection. I don't know what it's actually called. Link category mode. Um, if you're familiar with the uh, connection types in Substance Designer, what this will allow us to do is simplify the number of outputs that we're dragging and connecting to other nodes based on the category that uh, we give these outputs. So I'm going to come on over and just double click here and type in material. I'm just going to copy that so I can go and paste this and everything else. That way, if we ever want to uh, utilize that uh, link category mode to really simplify, uh, you know, taking the outputs from this node into other nodes, it's going to be a lot easier that way. And we've just gone ahead and set it up pretty easily. 
Now let's take a look at exposing some parameters that we can use elsewhere once we bring this graph uh, into other material graphs. So I'm back at the very beginning where this is all started, right? The genesis of our brick material here at the brick generator. And I want to expose one of the uh, parameters in here, mainly the count option. This is going to allow us to change the X and the Y number of bricks. And so the first way we can expose a parameter is if we right click on it and expose as input parameter. So you'll see that uh, it provides us now with this count node that's been plugged directly into that count input uh, socket there. And it also appears up on the right hand side where we have our uh, inputs for this graph. So now we've got this count option here. I'm going to just quickly drag that over so we have a little more space. And you'll see that as I start to change this up, it now starts to also affect our graph because we're directly plugging in these variables. And so I can no longer control it from this here. You'll see that as I start to do this, it has no effect because it's being controlled from the graph itself. And you can also see that um, as we have a little connection here, right? We can see that this is being controlled elsewhere just with this little uh, graphical user uh, GUI element here. So let's go and rename this. I'm gonna rename this maybe something like number, and that'll change the name. It'll change the name in our graph as well. I can also fine tune the input here. If I click on it and then come on over to the uh, variable editor, this is going to allow me to uh, better customize it to my liking. So the name, again, we've called it number. The type is a vector two of integer type. You have a whole bunch of different um, data types to choose from, which is really cool. I know some of these maybe look a little bit intimidating, but fortunately, because of the way we've exposed this parameter, um, we don't have to worry about it. It's going to set it to the correct data type. You can also change the type of GUI that uh, is visible for this type of parameter. So you'll see that we have slider. I can change it to spin box. So now if I scroll up and down, It'll change it. We don't have that slider anymore. Uh, you can have a, you know, a, a vector angular, so it's kind of like angle-based, which might produce kind of weird results or weird user experience, and so on and so forth. So you're going to have a bunch of different options to play with depending on the data type that you have. So I'm going to go back to 4 and 12. You can also set range minimums and range maximums if you want users to... Uh, stay within a certain range. Um, it might break your workflow or your node depending on if the user maybe exceeds that. So you can set that here as well. So something to take note of that is a little bit different than applications like Substance Designer is that these variables actually exist within our graph here. You can see that, right, it produced a node for us that is sitting here in the graph. It's not some hidden property that um, is attached to the node or attached to one of these variables somewhere. And initially my kind of gut instinct was that I didn't really like that, um, but I find that I'm coming around to the idea because I can quickly see where variables are being used in my graph. And it's really helpful to be able to see that just at a glance. It does kind of clutter up the graph a little bit, but the trade-off is clarity within your graphs. So that's something to just take note of and a major difference from designer. What's kind of cool too is as you start to create some of these inputs, you can even go ahead and start to search for them. And you'll see that we now have input parameters number and I can go ahead and create uh, this node here. We're not stuck to just this one that we've created. Now, another way that we can go about exposing parameters is rather simple, but it's a great way if we have a bunch of parameters that we'd like to expose um, kind of in one go. You'll see that as we click on this, right? And if I go and right click on this, we have to expose one at a time and it just becomes very cumbersome as we're right click, expose, right click, expose, and so on and so forth. So what I'll do here is select this node and right click the node. And I would like to go down to expose input parameters here. So when I select that, it's going to pull up this dialog and it's going to give me every single parameter that this node has. We can see it provides us with the name of the input, 
as well as the data type too. So we can kind of get a sense of the type of data uh, that we're playing with here. So I'm gonna go and expose a couple of these. I'm going to do gap size. I'm also going to scroll down a little bit and do distance offset as well as variance offset. And you'll see that it's going to expose these as and then provide us with a name. If you want to go ahead and say, uh, you know, position offset, we can go ahead and type in something different and it's going to rename it as that. So we don't have to wait for it to get exposed and then go and tweak some of those settings. We can already do that here. So once I've enabled these with these little toggle boxes, I'm going to hit expose and it's going to create a whole bunch of these input parameters again. And if we take a look, we can see that we also have these newly created inputs in our graph overview. They've also come along with some uh, categories here, which is going to allow us to tweak the uh, UI. And depending on what you're doing or the desired outcome, you might want to uh, try to categorize some of these things off from each other. What I'm going to do is try and keep everything within one though. So I'm gonna come on over to our variable editor and under category here, I'm just going to go and delete that. So now that one should be directly under our number because it's no longer in that offset category. And I'll do the same thing for uh, each one of these here. Now, the final way to create an input parameter is by actually going into our uh, graph overview here. And on the right-hand side, you can see that we can manually input one of these parameters. So I'm going to select this. And now we have a bunch of data types that we've seen already to choose from. Now this one is a little bit more uh, advanced I'll say because you kind of have to already know the type of data you want to be manipulating when you go to do this. So before we do that I'm going to go over to the node that I'd like to uh, access from this uh, parameters which is going to be this directional warp. So if I click on this what I'd like to access is this intensity slider here. Now, just based off of the way that we interact with this, I can see that it is a floating point number because it's a number that has decimal points. And so I'm just already aware that that is what this data type is. So if I come on back to my graph, just clicking on the graph there, click on our add parameter, and I go on down to float 32. You'll see that again, right, we have that pink input there. So that means that these are the correct or corresponding data types. I'm going to call this droop intensity. And now to actually use this in our node, what I'll have to do is drag this into my graph and create it like this. I could also go ahead and start to type in droop. Remember, we can actually search these parameters once they've been made and create it that way. So how do I plug this in, right? There's no sockets for me to actually plug this in. Well, I'm going to drag the output from this socket and hover over the expand. And you can see that these are all of the parameters that this node has to offer, but they've just been hidden by default because they're already being taken care of by the parameters within the node. So something like this directional warp only really requires the input and the input uh, intensity input from the user and the rest is already being taken care of. So this is where we're going to use our input parameter to override one of these, being this intensity input here. So when I let go of that, you can see now we've exposed that here. It's changed in our 3D and our 2D view because we have an intensity of zero and we can now go ahead and set a default intensity and control it by this parameter here. So I'm going to select droop intensity, come on over, and I'm going to change it from spin box because spin box is a really kind of unintuitive slider type for this particular input, right? We have to just click and then drag up. That doesn't seem really uh, like it makes a lot of sense for us. It would be nicer to have just a regular slider. So I'm going to change this to be slider here. So now we have, you know, towards the right, more intense, towards the left, uh, zero intensity. And I believe our default value was something like 0 0.1, which looks good in our 3D view. Another really cool feature that I 
didn't really realize I'd actually kind of like until I started playing around with it is this unit option. At first, I didn't really understand what it was doing, but what's really cool is we can actually start to add units to the sliders of these parameters. So if I say that, you know, we're operating in this made up unit of measurement called droops, you'll see that I'll put in DRPS, which stands for our droops measurement. It's now gone ahead and added that droops to the actual value. And if I come back to the object editor, you can see that we have 0 0.10 droops as an operating intensity for the directional warp. Now, obviously droops is uh, just made up on the spot here, but you're free to put in things like millimeters, centimeters, liters, whatever types of units of measurement you want that makes sense for the type of operation that you're trying to achieve. So that's gonna be fine and dandy for our inputs, but what if we need to work with uh, some of these other options, right? What if we want to control from a higher level a lot of these different input parameters for various nodes, and we don't want to expose that functionality to outside of our graph for other people to mess around with. So I'm gonna go on back to our first graph or our first uh, frame here by hitting Alt and one. Remember we have the hotkeys for the frame set up. And I'm gonna take a look at our brick generator. So we can see that one of the input parameters we have for it is this vertical offset and it is a Boolean data type. It's just an on and off switch which we can see if we toggle here, is going to drastically change the look of the bricks. Now, for whatever reason, we might not want to expose this functionality out to other artists to use this in their graphs, but we do want to uh, tweak this parameter in the graph. Maybe we're creating two types of uh, brick generation materials and we don't want to uh, cross streams here or allow artists to kind of mess up some things because maybe it messes things up later on in this graph if we do this. So what we can do if I click on my graph background again is come on down to local variables. And this is what's going to allow us to create exactly the same type of parameters as we did up here, but they're going to be local to this graph. So we can't edit them when we bring this graph into other graphs and operate on it as a node. So I'm going to select a variable. And again, remember, I uh, recall that this is a Boolean data type. So I'm going to select Boolean. And let's just drag that into our graph. And we can call it something like vertical. And you'll see that it has a bit of a different icon from these other input parameters. And that's very much the reason why is that these are input parameters, so they can receive data coming in from other places. However, this vertical Boolean uh, node here is local to this graph. So let's just plug this in to our vertical offset and collapse this. So now I can control that vertical offset from this here. Sweet, so functionally, it's still exactly the same. If I come on over to our packages and I go ahead and just create a new project, we're going to do an elemental graph or an element graph and we'll create it without a template and now i go ahead and drag this brick material in we'll see that we have all of our input parameters here but we don't have that vertical one so that's what i mean when i say that we are keeping it local to the graph we're not exposing that functionality to anyone else who will drag this material in and start to play around with its options You'll even see here that we don't have that vertical option uh, within our graph. Now, if I come back to our graph here and I enable vertical and I go ahead and save it and I go back to our unnamed, you can now see that um, it is working, right? We have now created that vertical offset, but we haven't exposed the ability to swap back and forth. Now, your reasoning for using local variables might differ um, depending on what you want to do. Flexibility might not be an option you want to provide your artists, but just know that that functionality is there and you can keep things local if you need them to stay local. So we made it, we're done, we're satisfied with what we have and we want to get this the heck out of here and into something else, right? So let's look at how we can export these. So I'm going to come on over to File, 
and then down to export image and data outputs. Uh, control O is the hotkey for this. And this is gonna bring up a dialogue for exporting all of the different data that we can use in Instamat. The reason that it is image and data output is because you can also process meshes here in Instamat, uh, which is going to be probably in a future video that I do at some point. So first thing is first, let's look at our output settings, right? You can uh, specify where you want to go ahead and save this. We can also give a uh, file naming format. So depending on the graph names, the output uh, image that you are actually exporting as well. And you can start to uh, set this up however your project demands. You can also go ahead and change, and I keep uh, scrolling over those hot uh, tooltips there. You can also go ahead and change the file format. And there's a bunch of different file formats as you can see here, but the default is going to be PNG. And I'll be honest, I don't really know what this does here. So I'm just gonna leave it alone. Uh, it works well if I don't start touching things that I was not meant to be touching. So next up is the actual export size. So here's where we can actually specify uh, the bit depth of the image as well as the resolution. Um, something to note as well, if I just go ahead and cancel out of this, is we can go and change the resolution of our graph as we're working. Just up top here, you can see that if I set this to 4K, it's going to hopefully quickly uh, generate our graph now at 4K resolution. So using the Control O hotkey to bring back up the dialog here, we can go ahead and set this to 4K as well and even increase the bit depth if we need uh, something a little bit higher fidelity for whatever we're doing. And then once we've gone ahead and done that, we can go and enable or disable any of these that we want to or don't want to export. And these are going to be all of those output uh, nodes or sockets that we went ahead and created. And if we're satisfied with that, we can go ahead and click export. Now, before we go ahead and close this out, I want to show you the idea of templates as well. You'll see that we have this export uh, template header down here. You can see that we have no template active right now. Uh, we've got a couple of default ones and then a couple of custom ones that have gone ahead and done as well. So to create a new template that we want to use maybe for other you know, assets in this project, We'll come on over to the right hand side, click on the little plus button here and create our new template. So you can call this whatever you want and you can even give it a description too. So once we click that, you'll see that we're going to have a bunch of things kind of populate this side of our dialogue. And if you're familiar with how Substance Painter handles exporting textures, this is going to look really familiar to you. So you'll see that up in here is where we are actually setting the types of textures we're gonna be exporting. So the first one here is an RGB. You can tell by the green socket here. So we can go and double click this and call it color. And now I'm going to come down to our outputs and drag in the base color output into uh, one of these little areas. It doesn't really matter which one because I can go and map this as RGBA or RGB. So if we wanted to plug, you know, maybe the, uh, let's find a different map here, maybe the opacity into the alpha, we can go ahead and do that. So now we're exporting um, an opacity output in the alpha channel of the base color. And then the base color output is going to take the RGB components. We can go ahead and mask, you know, a displacement image as a grayscale map just on its own. And say we wanted to output maybe like an RMA map or a roughness, metallic, and ambient occlusion. What we can do is create a new output being RGBA. If I go ahead and find my roughness, plug that into the red, the metalness into the green, and ambient occlusion into the blue, and then maybe I can go ahead and you know plug in uh, some type of transmission or something into the alpha. We're able to do channel packing in this way by creating these custom export templates, which we're just not gonna be able to do uh, with these raw exports over on the left-hand side. So to do that, we'll have to actually create a template. And then we can go and call this like RMA or whatever you want. So regardless of how you go ahead and set up your texture exports, once you're ready to get these out of Instamat, go ahead, click on this little export button, 
and you are good to go. Well, unfortunately, it is that time for us to depart one another. I want to thank you for sticking around throughout the entirety of this video, even if it wasn't all in one sitting, because frankly, I didn't even record this all in one sitting, so I wouldn't blame you if you couldn't do that. We covered a ton of content, and hopefully you've learned a thing or two. Some of it's stuck with you. You might have to watch and come back to various sections of this video, so I'll timestamp that for you. But I really do mean it when I say that we've really only covered a fraction of what this software can do. We've pretty much barely touched the surface of what Instamat is capable of. Um, there's a bunch of other project ideas that I'd like to tackle, namely all of the other project types that come with Instamat, like the NPass or the Atom graphs and the function graphs, which are kind of paired with Atom graphs. So I'm going to be looking into uh, doing some more of those complicated areas and figure those out for myself and hopefully provide some useful content for you guys, as well as the layering projects, which is more akin to Substance Painter or Substance Sampler with their material layering, as well as Materialize Image, which allows us to take a photograph and convert it into a PBR material. So there's a lot to really cover with this software, but first I have to learn it myself. Please make sure to drop any questions or comments that you have down below, as well as any feedback on this course. I'm open to hearing where you'd like to kind of expand your knowledge on this software or even where I messed up. Because again, like I said, I'm still learning this software myself. So if there's areas that I was pretty adamant about not working or doing it in a way that um, is actually counterintuitive to how it probably should be used, uh, please let me know. I'd like to learn how to use this as best as I can so that I can in turn show you guys how to do stuff a lot better in Instamat. So thanks for watching. All the best guys. And until next time.